Hey, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this, uh, the fifth and final online presentation for uh, Society of Glass uh, Milk and Technical Committee uh, training days uh, for the 21 to 22 sessions. Uh, with us is, uh, excuse me a minute, Jan Theron uh, from Lucidon. Uh, and I'll give a quick introduction before uh, for, for him just before he starts. Um, just a couple of things. Um, if you have a question, the question and answer box is available to you. So you can either type in a question and we will uh, ask it on your behalf or come to you to ask it. Or if you are struggling to type, uh, please raise your hand. Uh, it's a function on the teams that will allow you to uh, ask the question. We will then uh, open the mic up for you and uh, uh, allow you to ask your question. Uh, as you heard, this session has been recorded and will be available online uh, after the presentation um, uh, uh, or, uh, on the basis of from Society of Glass. Uh, and just as a wee bit of a sales talk, uh, just prior to starting, uh, normally we would have come out a lot earlier uh, for this, uh, but Furnace Solutions for this year uh, has now been set uh, for the beginning of uh, June, on the 8th and 9th of June. Uh, that is going to be held at St Helens Rugby Club this year, um, so, so a different venue. Uh, so hopefully uh, everybody will be able to come along to that. We will be sending out more information. There will be information advertised on uh, in the Glass magazines and online. So if you do have any questions, please do uh, contact us uh, for, for those. And uh, we look forward to seeing everybody face to face uh, in June. Uh, so uh, our presenter today is, as I said, Jan Theron. Uh, Jan was born in South Africa, where he spent most of his life until 20, 2008, where he joined Saram, which is now Lucidon. He has a chemical engineering background and started working in the petrochemical industry uh, with Sassel. During that time uh, of his career, he veered off into the world of refractories, with about, uh, which was about 23 years ago. So. Uh, Jan's industry experience stretches from refractory maintenance, management, inspections, quality control, failure analysis, testing, training, and oh, uh, consultancy. Jan's experience is diverse and includes many various types of units in different industries, such as incinerators, reformers, heaters, arc furnaces, induction furnaces, rotary kilns, shaft, shaft kilns, sulfur burners, boilers, reactors, uh, as well as glass melting furnaces. The list is actually quite long here, so I'll just I'll cut a few of them off. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to hand the, the presentation across to Jan, uh, and uh, we look forward to uh, listening to you, Jan, on the challenges of tin bath locks. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and uh, welcome to everybody sitting in and listening today. I would like I yeah, hope that you enjoyed today's um, session. Uh, Nigel Longshaw asked me, I guess, about two years ago whether I would like to do something. And I thought at that point in time, you know, there's something about the tin baths that that is really, uh, it's, it's almost like a hidden, hidden part of the, the furnace. And very few people actually talk about it, although we do a bit of tasting on it at Lucidian. And I thought, it's really a good opportunity to to explore this a little bit more, to understand the taste a little bit more, and of course, putting the presentation together, I actually learned more, I think, than uh, than anything else. And I hope I can share some of that learning that I've done in preparing all this to you today. Uh, it's really it's really pretty interesting. So just to give you some sort of a background, <clears throat> we um, we do quite a lot of tasting. In general, I mean, it's not only us at Lucidian, but I mean, in general, in the glass industry, there's quite a lot of tasting that, that's done for the glass industry as such. And of course, I think most of the tasting is mostly um, directed towards the furnace and the regenerators. And so you'll see there, we do simulation tests 
glass corrosion, exudation, stoning, blister, resistance to alkali, tech, thermal shock resistance, proof test, <clears throat> and then a few others. Now today, um, I'm really just gonna focus on two specific ones. And the one is the proof test, and the other one is actually not on this list, I just realized this, and it's the hydrogen diffusivity test. And these two are specifically designed and applied just for the tin bath uh, section of the furnace of, 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 of course, of flat glass. Um, so what we have is the float glass process, as we see today, uh, was invented in 1959 by the Pilkington brothers. It's, it may seem like a lot of years ago, but it, in fact, it is not that long. If you look at photos from before then, they were still polishing glass and grinding it down to, to be flat. So this was absolutely an amazing type of process that was developed. Now, over the years, <clears throat> as, as you introduce something new into your process, you, you start off with something and say, well, it's actually not too difficult. You know? The idea was to have glass running on a liquid bath and, and that bath was thin and whatever the reasons were, they've chosen thin. Um, there's most probably quite a lot of reasons which we're not gonna go in here today. But the main thing is you've got a liquid on a liquid and that gives you a nice flat piece of glass and you, and you gradually cool it down. But as they started using this and they had to, they needed to put refractory underneath the tin, they started seeing some, some defects in the glass coming up. And the first one that they've realized that caused them a, quite a bit of problems with tadpoles. Now there's a little picture of a tad, tadpole there. I'm sure in today's life, we will not see tadpoles anymore, but this is where they started off. Started off with seeing these nuisance things on there and they called them tadpoles because they resemble the tadpole. And this was caused by alkali migration um, through the tin bath into the refractory that caused low liquid, low melting point liquid phases to form. And that liquid would then sort of rise up to the top and form this impurities, oh, this, um, this false. And well, the solution to it was quite simple. And I'll go over it just in a moment from then. And, and then they just sort of sorted that one out and then they realized, well, they've got a new one. And, and that was caused by, again, some new material that was placed into, into the tin baths and, and all of a sudden they realized, hell, oh, they've got a lot of bubbles in there all of a sudden. And, and a lot of you know, investigation went into trying to understand why this is happening and so forth. And, and in my opinion, from the way I perceive the information that I managed to get hold of, is that this was most probably, most, mostly done by Pilkington in those years. And, and I mean, as they were the, you know, basically the inventor of this process, I think they, they, they took a lot of responsibility on and trying to solve every single problem. Um, and as, as they sort of understood that one, the next, the next one came up, which they then called seven inch splitting. And that's where the, the bottom bar blocks again, just started to break up. Now, again, it's, it's, you've got one problem, you try and solve that problem, you come up with other material and then you create another problem. And this is exactly how it sort of developed. And, and then finally, the final one, after everything is Nepheline flaking. And this was also caused by changing the, the, the refractories at the bottom. And now instead of having liquid phases going up, you've got sort of a crystalline Nepheline forming and that has got a um, slightly different properties than the original material and it starts flaking off in thin layers. So over the years, you know, these bottom bath, bath blocks, which you would think, hmm, it's not a very harsh environment for them to actually work in. They did give the industry uh, lots of problems. Now, just to give you some sort of an idea of, of what we are dealing with, we're dealing with a, basically a box there. And inside this box, we've got an atmosphere which is there to protect the tin from oxidizing. So we've got 95, 90 to 95% nitrogen in there um, and five to 10% hydrogen. And of course you'd like to reduce the amount of oxygen as far as possible. And, and there could always be a little bit of leaks in there. I'm not entirely sure how this 
this fits together. But if you just look at the bottom, you will then find that you've got your refractory layer there with quite a low density compared to the other stuff. Uh, so the refractory density would sort of vary between 2 to 2.5. And on top of this, you've got molten tin ranging from around 1100 degrees at one end to 600 degrees on the other end. Let me just go again. Um, and that would have a density of 6.5. So you can already see that if, if there's any loose refractory in there, it will, it will really just pop up like a cork in water. And then on top of this, you've got your soda liquid soda lime silica glass, which is about at, uh, where's my cursor, at 2.3 um, grams per cc. So, and effectively what you need is then you need these bath blocks to be tied to the floor and to be quite nice and tight in there so that, you know, you don't get this tin running through the, the gaps. Uh, so it needs to be quite a tight type of lining and it needs to be all well together there. Now, the, as I said, the first one that they encountered was, was this um, tadpole issue. Now, at that, at that time in the life of tin baths, they, they typically use fire clay bricks with about 30% of alumina in there. And this is that green dotted line. Now, the sodium would then, from the glass, it, it would then sort of go through the tin, tin bath and get into contact with the refractories and, and slowly start to react with the refractories. And as you can see, of course, you start off there with your refractory and on the other end, you've got your sodium. And as it slowly starts to build up the, the, and react a little bit, a little bit, you get changes in your refractory structure up to a point where you could then get, you know, melting points of lowest 900 to 15 degrees. So at a thousand degrees, this would be a liquid. And if there's enough of this, it will sort of like float off through the tin bath and stick to the underside of your um, of your glass that you want to be quite you want to have it quite flat. So the, the obvious yeah, the, the obvious solution to this is then just just increase the, the alumina content. You know, just get it to this way. So the first adjustment they made was from thirty to forty percent, and I think nowadays they use about forty five percent. But there's also been other changes into into the into the refractory itself. And we tend to stay away from the silica part and have a calcium aluminate type of material. So these are all done to, to prevent this reaction with, um, with the um, sodium that comes from the glass, basically. So there's a bit of an indication of how it, how it works. A, a simple solution to a simple, relatively simple problem. And we're not going to talk about, there are ways to taste this, of course, we can do an alkali test, but I'm not going to go too much in detail with this now. The next one that came up that was really quite a big of an issue was, was the fact that we've, the, that they, that pieces of the, these blocks are actually spalling off. And it's spalled off in thicknesses of about eight to 10 inches, oh, sorry, six to six to eight inches. And they, they refer to it as the seven inch um, oh, spalling. And it, it took them a bit of time to figure this one out and you'll see how it, uh, how it sort of progressed. I, I, I would like to spend a little bit more time in explaining this. Um, so in principle, you have these blocks sitting together. And if I just can find my cursor now, there we are. So you've got one block there and another block there next to it. And as, as you heat it up, as you can see from just move this up. As you can see from this uh, little um, diagram on this side, if you eat the original square block, one side, one side, the odd face side, the gold face side, you will find that in the odd face side, it actually expands more than in the bottom. And so you get a slightly different shape of it if it's, if it's completely free to move. So if, if the original block is now, there's no restrictions on it, and it can just expand as it wish. It would look more or less like this um, unsquare shape here now. But because we put it in a sort of a system where this movement, this sideways movement is now restricted. I'm to find my cursor. Here we are. 
so you strict this. You can't. It, it actually can't move the way it wants to move. And because because it can't move that way, you basically put this this part of the lining under compression. And of course, the compression at the top would be much more as and as we move down, it will become less and less and less because because there's not so much expansion at the bottom. And again, as we create this compression. We also create within. I always need to find this. We also create a plane in which they are now tension because, as we, as the compression has got different amounts, there's a part. So there's planes, tension planes as such running parallel or not parallel, but parallel to the hot phase. But if you exceed that tension from one part to another part you can actually crack the material there. And this is exactly then what happened. So how, how do we taste and how do we fix this problem? And, and so they came up with this very clever idea of producing some sort of a, a sample which, which mimics what can happen in the furnace itself. So I've got my lining on this side, as you can see. And what we try to do is we try to make something which would resemble that, that situation in the furnace. Uh, what we have there is a steel plate and we have holes to it and we bolt it to that steel plate. But instead of having now, remember in our test, we are not able to, to perform this hot side, cold side scenario. We actually have to do this now in a physical way. So instead of having um, a hot face, cold face, we have a straight face there and then we tapered it off to this way so that if we now put this under a compression load, we only compress this part, trying to sort of simulate what happens in this upper section of my actual floor of the tin bath. But then the lower down, it doesn't actually touch, but we still have material there. And so they simulated this this type of thing in a in a in an actual sample, and this will all be then crushed at um, at room temperature. A, a little bit more detail on this. There is an actual photo of many 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 years ago, and hopefully you can see a little bit better. But so this piece of metal that we see there on this side now in my uh, little drawing um, is that one up there, and just to just to align it, it's it's welded to a nine to a ninety degrees um, steel plate there, which we just clamp onto the equipment, so it stands up nice and straight, and it's held in place with this um, steel contraption on this side. We then have a well, Instron, a crushing machine that can exert a force, you know, in this direction vertically, as shown by the by these arrows there. And we have a little extensometer that measures the actual travel of this whole thing. So we can measure two things here. We can measure the deflection, how the sample now actually deforms. And we can also relate this to the, to the load that's required to do that. And, and for this specific test, there's a standard rate at which we, we um, lower this cross beam. So just to make it uh, consistent all the time. And, and there's a little drawing of, of how you cut the sample. Now the sample cutting is quite complex. So one of the drawbacks of this type of test is of course, it, it takes a long time to prepare this little sample. And you'd ask, why don't we just put the big block in there? Well, yes, we can put the big block in there. We can just cut the corners, but then you need a really big machine for that to press it. So again, these things were developed sort of with relatively standard equipment in mind. What we then produce with this um, test is a graph that looks something like this. Um, and this is my strain, com compressive extens extension. And, and of course, as you compress it now and you increase the, the load on it, it, it deforms. And it deforms more or less in sort of a way that this graph is showing. And I'll show a little bit more of this later on. And the way that we calculate it is to look at the strain between my point where it actually breaks, which is now B there, 
and a place where you think it's start with start now why do we, why don't we start at that point there well it's just because there's a bit of settling in taking place and and we tend to cut this first part off so we get a slightly because this part although this graph shows a very nice it could be quite wiggly and waggly so so we just try to to eliminate some of that noise and uh, it wouldn't make it doesn't make a real big difference but it is just for for practical purposes so this is the uh, the distance that we then take um, and we divide it by the original length, which you will see in the previous slide is in fact 127 millimeters. Um, but we act, we measure it precisely. And so then you get a number, a, a number which is called a, and a, and a percentage, which is just called your, your strain, um, strain value that you produced by the, by this, what we call a proof test. Um, similar to this, is what we call a compressive stress strain. And, and, and there's, I'll show you another relationship between the two because there's one, there's two ways in which you can almost do this test. So the other one is to do a compressive stress strain because this in, in fact is to, to some, some, some degree what, what we're doing there. We, we're compressing something and it creates a line, a plane of tensile that too much for the material to handle. It, it breaks off there, it goes with a big bang. Um, but what if we can do it in a slightly easier way where we don't need to do this fancy cutting? And so they looked at the compressive stress strains for this. And the compressive stress strain um, is where we then use a, a little, a little um, cube there. And we drill a hole in the cube to put our measuring equipment in and, and, and this is our, our load. And we put a load onto this until it then breaks and we measure the deflection and the, the stress that was created, the load on there. And we get a graph similar to the one I've, I've just shown you. And the first part is of course my static elastic modulus and, the, and, and as we go to this part of the curve, we go into, my, into our plastic modulus. And what one has to realize is that you've got, you have got a variable you know this this modulus of elasticity is not is not a constant value it changes as you as you increase the load on it it actually changes and so if you use this this value with an mor you can then also get a relationship between whether the material could be able to withstand this um the stress and deformation that it needs to needs to um um handle in that capability. Now just to give you some sort of a feel for what we're looking at, this is a, a graph of the same thing, compressive stress strain, but at different temperatures. So we've got yet temperatures up to 1150 and this was just for a fire brick. And as you can see at 20 degrees, 260 degrees, at 550 degrees you can see the curve is starting to to soften the material is starting to soften a little bit. In this case, at 980 degrees, it was relatively soft. Um, come on, go back. If we do our proof test, it's really difficult doing it under the actual temperatures that the material is working in. So, so in order to see how rele relevant this um, actual test is, you know, this is what you'd like to do. You'd like to just to verify that you don't change the properties from room temperature to where you actually, where it's actually operating, um, that it doesn't change too much. Now, this may seem like quite a lot, you know, quite a big difference, but it's still relatively small because if we just go, yeah, 150 degrees, 170 degrees higher, you will see that this curve is now completely different. But this is, again, it's above the temperatures that you'd be actually working your, your tin bath blocks. So in principle, we are relatively safe to say that if we test this at room temperature, it's not too far off from what it may actually see at, at its operating temperature, which is something between 600 degrees and of course 1000 degrees. Um, and for this reason, we can get away with, in, in, in most cases, with, uh, with testing it only at room temperature. 
but it's something that you should keep in mind in terms of in terms of what you have and how you taste it now in those days when they did these tests and they they looked at the proof test which is that complicated shape of um, of a sample and they looked at um, just doing a model of rupture and uh, elasticity models of elasticity um, and get the relationship between this they found out that in fact there is a bit of a relationship between the proof test which is a which is a single test that you do but it's a quite a complicated test to to prepare and the relationship between an mor modulus of rupture divided by its elastic modulus now to get sort of an idea of of what we are saying here is that you can get a material that's really strong but if that material doesn't flex a little bit to accommodate for that expansion where it wants to move into a space that it hasn't got, it's going to create extremely high stresses. And even though it's stronger, uh, it will break much easier. So if you imagine, if we go back to this graph, and this is my, this is my stress strain curve of, of compressive stress strain. If I have a material that for instance, operates on this line there, you can see it's not a very strong material. It, 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 it would sort of survive 12 MPA. So if we do a, assume this is now all the same temperatures. Don't just, let's assume for the moment, it's just all the same temperatures. You would say that something of 12 megapascal is not really a strong break. Okay, we don't need some, we don't, we need something stronger than this. We need something that can do, you know, say argument sake, um, 50 MPA. And so somebody puts in a, a stronger brick in there than the 12 MPA. You will find that you'll be on this curve then there. So you, you have something that's, that can do 50 MPA. But now, for instance, look at how much strain it can handle. This one, if I put load on it, it will deform without breaking. It will only deform to 12 MPA, but it will deform a lot. Whereas this one, develops that stress extremely fast as as you as you reduces its space to moving and and therefore even though this this brick there is much stronger on a cold crushing than this one now forget about those 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 numbers there now for the moment okay just look at this, this two. you will then find that the brick that can actually deform more is is a more practical brick to have and this is typically what you'd like to see in your um, in your tin bath. You don't necessarily need something that is really strong, but you need something that can handle the stresses and and can deform without actually breaking. And this is what you're looking at. And this is exactly what this graph is actually telling you. So the the proof test, the more it can deflect. Remember, the proof test is is the value of that deflection divided by its original value. So the higher this number is, 0.4% or something like this, it means it, it can move further before it breaks. And that's reflected in the other measurement of MR versus, versus elasticity. Now you've got to, of course, be careful when you do, when you compare these two, that you don't mess up with doing this elastic modulus of elasticity or elastic modulus in a wrong way, because there's many ways to to actually perform that test. <clears throat> and there's one that uses um, frequent residency and you need to stay away from that one unless you create a slightly new graph for this. So this, this type of relationship was found in the way that I've just described, not, not other ways. So you've got to be a little bit careful with, with just using these numbers uh, and adopting a slightly different test method for it. So that's, a, that's the only part that you need to be careful of. Um, right, so this is this is enough said, I think, about the proof test and the fact that what you really want in there is a brick with a bit more elasticity, um, but also with a certain amount of strength, just to just to keep it in place there and keep keep those um, these nuts and bolts properly in place. The next challenge that um, that they had in the past, and, and we test for this still 
quite uh, significantly, is the hydrogen diff diffusivity, diffusivity test. And that is, um, in principle, it's predicting the transpira transpiration potential. Now, these are all quite difficult things to understand, but let me try to give you some sort of a feedback on where it started off. So once they started seeing these little bubbles on underneath the glass, they weren't quite sure where it was, where it was coming from. It, it didn't happen straight from the beginning. It only happened because at one stage in America somewhere, they replaced the standard bricks that they imported from the UK with local bricks from, from the USA. And all of a sudden these bricks started making this little bubbles. And um, the question was asked, why? Everything is the same. The, you know, the porosity is the same, the density, the, you know, the chemical construction is the same. Why would he do this? So of course, a, a lot of work went into trying to understand this. And what they found was basically that, first of all, it was hydrogen. There was hydrogen in these little bubbles. So they analyzed the bubbles and found that it was hydrogen. Second thing, of course, was where does it come from? Um, and they realized that it's coming from, because you're in, in a hydrogen environment, it's actually coming from the under, underside of your, um, of, your, of your bricks, because the bricks are porous, of course, and, and the hydrogen would now be everywhere in, in, in the unit. But normally what you'd see is because you've got a hot phase and a cold phase that the gas would be pushed away from the hot phase to the cold phase. So, so generally speaking, you wouldn't suspect, you know, gas from the bottom to actually go through the brick and into the tin bath and all the way up to the top. You wouldn't expect this to happen. But what they've realized is that the same as, um, as, as trees are getting their water to the leaves from the, from the roots, you've got this um, effect of, of working against your temperature gradient um, depending on the pore sizes that you've got. And so through a lot of experimentation, they came up with this um, relationship here where they basically said that if a material has too many fine pores and the pores are of a certain size, which is, which is between 0.1 and 0.6 um, micrometers. Now the 0.1, I'm not 100% sure where that comes from. I didn't actually put it in, but it, it is quoted in literature. But whether this is the smaller size they could measure or whether there's something you know significant about the 0.1 micrometer but in any case if a material has got a large amount of this very small um pores in there it seems to to enhance this effect of of hydrogen moving from the bottom colder part of the brick up to the top and so this graph give you some sort of a feeling for it. And, and of course, the one way to do this is then on every single brick that you put in, you do a, a pore size distribution, which is a complex and expensive test to do because it, it involves mercury that you try and push through there. Um, and, it, and it was just not, it was just a, a bit of a, you know, a slip to do this, this day. So, so they came up with a very, ingenious way in, in which to do this. And this is with hydrogen diffusivity, diffusivity. Um, a very simple piece of kit and a very simple technique of doing it and a really interesting technique. And basically it, it consists of a chamber, a, a piece of metal, and then underneath is a chamber just all hollow, hollow space and you put your refractory sample in it and of course you seal it now quite well on the side so that there's no gas that can escape there so anything that needs any gas that needs to go through there would go through the sample and not bypass the sample so these are the typical things that you need to be on the lookout for when you do the actual test but um in principle you would then put hydrogen through it so it's literally just standing on the side the hydrogen cylinder you open the valve and you put some hydrogen in there and you open the valve so that your water um, pressure sensor that you've got this 
mon monometer, that, um, that he's got about 100 millimeters of water difference between the lowest part and the, and, and the highest part. And I'm, I'm trying to illustrate this as best as possible there. And this is quite logic. I mean, so you've got a high pressure on this side, pushes the water out to that side into atmosphere, you get the difference there, and that's what you, and you set it at that point. And then your equipment is, your test is now ready for the next, the next moment of, of the test. And the next moment is that you would then close the hydrogen that you put into this um, kit. Now, another thing that you've got to remember is you've, you've got to remember that not to confuse this with, um, with permeability. Because in the permeability test, we almost do the same type of thing. We have a similar type of setup and we put uh, air at the bottom and, and, then, and then we see how quickly the air goes through it. Okay, and, and that's permeability. Now you'd, you'd already start to get sort of a feel for that these two could be very similar, but in fact, it's, it's not really, it, 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 it's quite different. So the next moment while you do it, the first thing, of course, you close this, um, this inlet of, of hydrogen. So the hydrogen is there, it's just running freely. So you've got that original, you know, difference in water levels there. You close that valve. And the moment you close that valve, you then, things happen there. And, and, and it's really an interesting sort of thing. And what, what you end up with is you end up with uh, a vacuum and you measure that vacuum. And that vacuum could be anything from, of course, no vacuum to a large vacuum. And that will tell you something about this behavior. So how does it actually work? Well, hydrogen is a very small molecule. And as it goes through the refractory, at a certain rate because the concentration on this side is more than the concentration on that side. And you've got a small pressure differences there as, as well. It's not a lot, but I mean, it is a small difference. Um, it, it would try and get out that way. But if it was only relying on pressure, once the pressure on the inside and outside the same, you would, of course, you would, you know, the, everything would be zero there. The two water levels would be the same point, but it actually carries on further. It actually draws a vacuum in there. And the reason why it draws a vacuum is um, it's because the hydrogen atom is, is quite small and it, and there's a difference in concentration between the, this, this part and the outside atmosphere. And it, it can e move easier out than what the nitrogen and the oxygen, of course, from the atmosphere can move inside. So there's a point in time when the hydrogen is gone, but the nitrogen still struggles to get through these little pores. And of course, the smaller the pores are, the bigger the, the, um, the vacuum that you will draw. So, so what's the accepted sort of range for this? Well, the accepted sort of range for this is, is a bit debatable. So people don't actually know exactly, and, and they're not exactly quite sure how to relate it in any case to this graph there. But through testing, they basically understood that if something that didn't give bubbles in your bath, this is what the result was, and something that did give bubbles, this is what the result was. They found out that, well, the safe margin to work in is 50 to 100 uh, negative, so vacuum. Now, this vacuum, there are some that believes that, you know, you can up, go up to 100 to 50, you can go up to even 200 or maybe even higher than this, but this is not... This is, I think this is a bit of a gray area, which we need to be a little bit more careful of. I personally, myself, I would say I'd rather keep to, you know, what we know works well and it's around 80. So anything between 50 and 100, I would sort of say that's a safe margin to be in. Anything that's lower than 30 is, of course, it, it, it gives you a potential for something else to happen. And that is that it means it's quite porous, big, there's quite big, um, a, 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 a big pores in there and, and quite well connected pores. And that could affect your, the, the amount of alkali attack that you've got. So it, you need quite a, um, a low porosity material to go in there, first of all. So you don't want to go too low. And I think that low values is most probably giving you Although it wouldn't cause bubbles, it could cause other problems. So I think people tend to stay a little bit away from, from those low numbers. 
and the high numbers, of course, in, in my opinion, I think this is where you're getting, you know, porosity that, or, or, or little cavities and tunnels and, 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 and little connections that are really small and that could potentially fall rather likely into this, um, into this red material here with, a, with quite a lot of fine pores in it. So, so I would tend to stay a little bit away from this, but again, th there are differences. There are sort of differences in opinion um, about this in the industry. Right, so this is um, pretty much where I'm gonna end off now. And I think what I can say finally is that over the years, uh, most problems seem to have been identified and, and sorted. So we, we almost, um, we're almost at that point where where I think we know quite well what we're doing. Uh, however, testing is still available and, and, and we can still check any new materials for anything like you know what we've experienced. So we don't repeat our mistakes of the past. Um, and I've mentioned this new group of materials based on calcium aluminate, of course, reduces the risk of this um, um, sodium attack on it and all the nephilim related uh, issues. So that sort of, that sort of um, leveled that one out. And the test that we still do most in, in our labs is of course the hydrogen diffusivity test. This is still one of our very, very um, popular tests done by end users as well as suppliers of material. Um, so even though it's a little bit sort of, you know, there's a bit of a gray area there that it, it still seems to be quite okay for the materials that are generally accepted for tin baths. And people do send it still in for, for this test. So I would say that that is, that is still quite a um, yeah, useful test. And then finally, I just want to say that in, in my understanding of, this, of these two tests, I've realized that Jeff Evans, who is not with us anymore, he, he obviously had a lot to do with this. Um, and the fact that we have something that's called the proof test, which I have absolutely no idea where the name came from. Um, but I'm pretty sure that if Jeff Evans was here today, he would have given you a little bit more of history of this. And you'll see that I have also incorporated quite a lot of his graphs in there, which, which is based on the work that they have done many years ago. So yeah, special thanks to him, of course, for all the work that he's, he's put into, into um, understanding you know, the, the concepts of tin bath blocks a little bit better. Thank you, and that's, that's the end of my... Uh, session for today. So any questions or any comments? I mean, I'd like to hear some comments about what some of you may have experienced in the field and, and how much you, you actually believe in this testing. Maybe, maybe you have some other tests that, that, that's also very useful for tin bars, which we don't even know about. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jan, for that. Uh, as Jan, Jan says, we are um, is very open to receiving questions and uh, any sort of comments. Uh, so if you have any questions, if you could raise your hand uh, or type your question in the question and answer box, uh, that would be great. Um, so while we're waiting on some questions, I have a, a, a first question for you, Jan. Um, are these test methods, the proof test and the hydrogen test, captured in any sort of way in, uh, as an industry standard, an international standard that people can re relate to? Uh, yeah, interesting question, of course, because I mean, we know that in the industry, in the refractory world, there's most tests that we actually do, people refer to, you know, do it by the AST method or do it by the British standard method or, or you know, European method or something like this. Um, and then we have the Eastern countries their taste method as well. And they, they seem to be all quite linked together. So if you do a cold crushing, for instance, there would be a certain requirement as to the sample size, the way that you load it, um, uh, and how you report the results, and how you do your calculations. Um, and these are all captured in very much a standard way that's accepted in the world. So you would refer to this test as a, as a quite... Now, we... We have these tests and they are classified as in-house tests, but I couldn't find anything that actually relates them to any other test that's officially. Now, whether this is because 
the glass industry is just a very small industry in itself. And, and this is a unique problem with only a, a small part of the furnace itself and also not a, a major part. I, I don't actually think it's in there and I don't think I will find it in there. I think it is something that's just owned in-house by the glass industry. Um, so, so yeah, this is, this is the only answer I have for. I mean, I, there is no nothing and uh, I'm not particularly sure why. Do, do, do you think there should be some sort of formalization of these sort of tests? Well, I would say. So my experience from this is, um, is that we do the test and and as I said in my introduction, you know, Nigel basically asked me to, to tell you a little bit more about it because we do these tests. And I, I started realizing that, you know, I don't know a lot about this, first of all. Um, and secondly, it doesn't look appear that there's a massive problem with it in the industry either. And thirdly, um, I think there's a bit of confusion as to what is acceptable and not. I don't think this the end users of you know glass furnaces actually specify in their specification that they would like to have a tin bath with a proof test of this value or a hydrogen diffusivity value of this or what or that. So I think there's a bit of you know uncertainty as to how to specify this actually in the industry. And I, and I, but I do think that there's if you talk to manufacturers, they would sort of say, well, we just do the test so that we just feel comfortable that it's the same as what we've last time delivered and the same that we've always done. So yeah. in, the way, in the way the industry feels more safe by actually doing it, by yes, should it be done? Well, I guess it would be not bad if, if it can be incorporated into a standard that's accepted sort of worldwide. But I'm not entirely sure who's going to drive that, whether this is you know, something that needs to be done from maybe an organization like yourself or or the industry itself. And I guess it's just not enough problems associated with it to to have this strong driver for it. It's a, it, it's almost like my diffusivity test, you know, the hydrogen moves easily out and 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 and, uh, and the nitrogen struggles to get in. Mm. And it's, <laughs> I think it's the same thing. The drivers aren't there's just not enough drivers to drive it in that direction, I guess. Okay. Um, right, we've got a quick question from David Moore, uh, or maybe something for you to comment on. Uh, he remembers the late David Martlow uh, commenting on stalactite like growths uh, from the bath, uh, tin bath bottoms, which would <coughs> eventually score the bottom of the float glass. Um, is this another alkali issue or? or what can you comment on that? Well, well I, <clears throat> I didn't catch that all the way. So, uh, is it something uh, about a uh, uh, comment to uh, uh, David Martlew, who used to be at Pilkington a long, long time ago, um, or uh, made a comment about stalagmite like growths in the in the tin bath bottom. Oh, uh, okay. Um, is this an alkali type issue or anything like that? I mean, to be, to be quite fair with you, I don't actually know the real answer for this. Um, but if it's something that seems to be growing out of the, out of the refractory, <coughs> one would almost want to assume. I mean, in principle, I don't think there's a lot of um, movement in, in the tin. The tin is liquid, but there would be a little bit of, you know, uh, movement due to changes in temperature. Uh, potentially, but I mean, there, there wouldn't be strong currents running around there. I guess it could be something coming out of the refractory and then just as it goes into the tin, it, it just stops, you know, and, and just starts growing slowly like the stomach. Right. Okay. Uh, no, we did but, have but, a hand. But I mean, the, case, the best way to do this is actually just to analyze it and see what, 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 what it consists of. I mean, that would be the first step that I would do is just to, is to, to try and get one of those pieces and just analyze it. Uh, right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we did have a hand up, a hand raised. Um, oh. Edward, uh, I'm going to allow you to talk, but hopefully you can still ask your question. Uh, you'll need to unmute yourself. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yes, we can. Thank you. Um, to, uh, just a small comment um, based on what was said. Um, it's my opinion that in the early days, 
you know, days of Jeff and that they were the pioneers. They were these issues, real issues for the manufacturers and the refractories just couldn't know wasn't up to the task. And they, uh, they developed these tests to understand what is the driving force. They develop new bath refractories and um, that work. And because of the concert, concert, uh, conservative nature of, of, of glass manufacturers, especially float manufacturers, is that, okay, this refractory works, we're gonna stick with it. And so, you know, you're not gonna to go to someone new to buy a bath bottle block, you're gonna to go to manufacturing X that has got 20, 30, 40 years experience in bath bottle blocks, because you know they've solved this problem. Um, I would think these tests would be relevant if someone new wants to do, to make refractories and have a comparison with, you know, say, like, this is uh, manufacturing A, making bath bottle blocks at X premium cost. Um, we knew and we want to sell you the same stuff, the same performance. And so they would have to use the same test and say, okay, this is how it performs and we're going to sell it to you cheaper. Uh, that's just my opinion. Oh, yes, I, I, I fully agree. I mean, we all we always have to do, and I think the, the main thing about this is what we see on data sheets, for instance, is um, we see the normal things about chemi chemistry, um, uh, porosity, bulk density, cold crushing, and, and that's about what you get on a data sheet. And, and if you think about a, a 10 bath block, you actually need a little bit more in there. It's, it's, it's a similar type of argument for using you know, materials in your regenerators, which suffers from creep, you can't just say, well, I need a, you know, 98% magnesium or something like this. You, you actually need to, to get a specification over that re reflects that creep situation that you don't want in your furnace. And I, and I guess this is exactly where you'd use this, this stuff as well. Um, yeah, to pretty much to compare with anything that's coming in that's new and just to make sure that it is sort of in alignment with what you used to used to have. And it is more specific, it is dead. I mean, I've never seen any of these tests used anywhere else except for the glass industry and only in tin bath blocks. So it, it, it doesn't come across as any other test for any other purpose other than tin bath bottom blocks. Okay. Um, does anybody else have any other questions or points they'd like to raise? Oh, sorry. Uh, you, you got, got one come through typed up from um, does hydrogen deficiency coefficients change as the temperature of the refractory changes? Yes, unfortunately it does. <laughs> so this is quite a complex situation. Here. When this test was devised, it was devised to do it under normal normal call it low pressures as well as, um, as as room temperature. But things like, for instance, the mean free path varies quite a lot with, um, with, um, with temperature. Temperature is the biggest influence in it. And, um, and also, of course, diffusivity itself would, would um, change depending on the temperature so it is a little bit more complex if you if you want to really go into a far more accurate sort of uh, experimentation or whatever you want to call this you'll have to consider all those aspects but i think it is there's enough safety factors or safety margin in in just doing it in at room temperature that we don't need to be too worried about it. I don't think we're sailing so close to the wind that we need to really worry too much about those those changes. It's I, I, I sort of, in a way, I sort of um, would classify it almost the same as, as when we do thermal calculations of the hot phase, cold phase, what it would be for a certain thermal conductivity of a material. Thermal conductivity of materials is also not linear and it also changes a little bit, but it's so small in most cases that we don't worry too much about it. And I think it's sort of a, something of a similar situation here. But yes, indeed it does. It, it, it is temperature sensitive in every, in every way. So you, we will get different react, you know, different behavior in the warm part of it than the cooler part, in the upper part of the brick and the lower part of the brick. So, you know, we have the 
we have that sort of complexity to it. Okay, uh, hopefully that uh, answers your question. Does anybody else have any uh, questions or comments? Unfortunately, the thing is, Jan, I can't see if anybody's typing. <laughs> Oh yes, yeah. <laughs> I do, I, it just appears. So, no, uh, no. The best way is actually just to um, to. Uh, but, but please, yeah. if you if you want, have a comment or a question, uh, we'll open up the mic to you, so you can always raise your hand. <clears throat> I mean, I would, uh, for instance, I my question to some of the listeners is, and I'm not quite sure how much experience you have got in this field, is whether you've actually had major problems with any of your tin baths. Not specifically just what I'm talking about, yeah, but. But maybe other problems that you think is important for somebody else to know about. Um, I mean, I've just spoken about two tests because these two tests were captured and, and made a, you know, it made a mark in the past on the industry itself. So, of course, it's tests that we still do. Um, and that's the only reason why I spoke about it. But it would be interesting. I mean, like, um, I can't remember, you know, previous one, previous speakers had said something about this stalactites that forms. Uh, really interesting. I mean, but maybe there's something else out there as well where people have have got some issues with thin bath in general that they'd like to share. Okay, so it's open to anybody that may want to make any comments. We're a couple of minutes. See, I think one of the things with test towels is like, well, Brazilian is one of them, is that you, you try and you try and, and produce a test that the industry can actually use and is is sort of effective in its its pricing and its complexity of of you know doing so at least you you know if it's too complicated to do then of course it becomes more expensive but the, the amount of mistakes that you can make is also more so when you try and devise a test for something you try and you try and formulate something that's relatively easy, gives you consistent results, but gives you enough information to say, well, this is either not good or it, it would be okay to do the job. Um, and it's almost that conversation that you need with the industry uh, in itself as a laboratory. I mean, I would struggle. I can sit and think how I can improve the taste, but in the end of the days, you, you, you do need a bit of feedback from the industry as well in terms of what their real wishes are. I mean, we would, for instance, say, you know, maybe five or 10 years from now, we won't be doing any of these tests anymore. And I would tell you, well, the industry don't need them anymore. At the moment, we still get quite a lot of inquiries and the industry still uses it. But it's almost like when I ask people, why are you using it? They're not quite sure why they're using it. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's a tried and tested method. No, and we are in an, in an industry that uh, doesn't change very fast. Yeah. Um, okay, um, there's no other questions coming through and uh, I haven't seen any hands raised. So cool. uh, what I'd like to do is thank you very much, Jan, for a very interesting presentation on behalf of the Melton Te Technical Committee of Society of Glass. Uh, very, very interesting to see how the, the, the uh, refractory is tested and, and, and the standards are, uh, the quality is maintained in that sense. Um, I would like to uh, thank everybody else for attending this. Uh, this, as, as I mentioned earlier, is the, the fifth of the five presentation uh, training sessions we've planned for 21-22 se season. 22-23 uh, uh, subjects will be coming out later this year. Uh, and just as a final reminder to everybody, the, the Furnace Solutions is going to be at the beginning of June and will be held at St. Helens Rugby Club this year. Uh, which is quite, uh, it's going to be a unique venue for us. Um, so, and we look forward to seeing everybody attending uh, where possible. Uh, so thank you all very much for your time. Uh, thank you, Jan, once again. And uh, we'll let you all get back to your very busy days. <laughs>